to DAISY 2020. For our next session, we're going to discuss about recorded procedures and discussion. Let me introduce you three chair. Alexander Mayer, doctor from Germany, Dr. Zhang Jianghua from Taiwan, and Dr. Chen Yingchen from Taiwan. And commentators, Dr. Raimi Chen from Japan, Dr. Huang Shiming from Taiwan, and Dr. Edward Chok from Singapore. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the session of uh, recall procedure and discussion. Uh, I'm Chairman, I'm Dr. Chen from Taiwan, and uh, my co-chairman is Dr. Zhang from Taiwan. And uh, let's, let's move to the next uh, presentation. For our next speaker, Let's welcome Dr. Sang So Yong from Korea talking about the topic, the usefulness of intraoperative blood flow measurement during AVF creation as a parameter for maturation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sam Song Yoon, working for Seoul St. Mary Hospital, Seoul, Korea. First of all, I'm very sorry that I could not participate in this symposium because of widespread of COVID-19 pneumonia in my country, South Korea. I really want great success of this symposium with the big effort of organizing committee. The title I will present today is the use usefulness of intraoperative blood flow measurement during ABF creation as a parameter for maturation. The number of end-stage renal disease patients is increasing rapidly due to increase of the elderly population and chronic disease. The major end-stage renal disease patient needs to take hemodialysis, so ABF might be the first choice for HD. ABF creation and maturation must be the major factor in improving both dialysis related outcomes and quality of life. The well matured and well functional ABF is very important for the HD patient. There are several causes of ABF malfunction. As we know, delayed maturation and maturation failure are major cause of ABF malfunction. ABF malfunction must be a significant contributor to mobility, long hospitalizations, and high medical cost. So early detection of non-maturation or malfunctioning ABF must be very important to improve access viability and avoid temporary CVC. Nowadays, several screening modalities are using to pre predict ABF malfunction, including static and dynamic pressure measurement, and measurement of urea recirculation, and ultrasound with Doppler and duplex technique. There are several risk factors for early ABF failure, including vessel diameter, gender, old age, race, diabetes, peripheral or coronary artery disease, surgical technique, type or location of access, and low ABF blood flow. Especially, intraoperative blood flow volume could be the parameter for early detection or predict of early ABF failure. This picture shows the vascular flow meter I'm using during vascular ABF creation in my hospital. This optimal flow meter system continuously measures, displays, and records the flow volume and other parameters. It is very convenient and easy to apply. 
This picture is a magnified portal for transducer. This perivascular flow probe is applied around the vein during AVF creation. The different difference between the two transit times is a measure of flow volume. After applying a flow probe to the vein, we need to wait 10 to 15 seconds for mean stabilized leading. This picture is actually operation field of applying flow probe during radiocephalic ABF creation. Measurements were repeated until consistent flow data was obtained. We usually perform the ABF operation under the following conditions. Vein diameter must be more than 2.5 mm with arm continuity. And arterial diameter must be more than 1.5 mm. Intraoperative blood flow measurement was taken 10 minutes after completion of the vascular anastomosis. And the flow probe was placed to encircle the cephalic vein about 5 to 10 mm behind the anastomosis. This algorithm shows a kind of protocol in terms of intraoperative blood flow measurement during ABF creation. The first step is creation of ABF. And then measurement of vein diameter to select flow probe size. And we check blood pressure if it is higher than 100. And we measure venous outflow volume. If venous outflow is more than 250 milliliter per minute in radiocephaly ABF, we expect this ABF maturation very well after four to six weeks later. This algorithm shows a kind of a protocol in terms of intraoperative blood flow measurement during ABG creation. The first is the crea creation of ABG, and then measurement of vein diameter to select flow probe size. And we check blood pressure if it is higher than 100, and we measure venous outflow volume. If venous outflow is more than 400 milliliter per minute, we expect ABG can be used. This chart shows a blood flow measurement result tested in my hospital after ABF creation. We can check the volume of blood flow in cephalic vein. In 1998, Dr. Johnson reported for the first time about prognostic value of intraoperative blood flow measurement in vascular access surgery. He wanted to know correlation of intraoperative blood flow measurement with outcome in vascular access surgery. This table shows the failure rate according to the amount of blood flow. In radiocephalic fistula, initial flow less than 170 milliliter per minute correlates with the ABF failure within 90 days. In brachiocephalic fistulas, death threshold was 280 milliliter per minute. To exam examine the relationship between intraoperative blood flow and ABF patency, they had to define high flow more than 320 milliliter per minute and low flow less than 320 milliliter per minute groups of patients. The primary and secondary patency in high flow group is higher than in lower flow group, as we expected.
to examine the relationship between intraoperative blood flow and AVG patency. They had to define high flow more than 400 ml per minute and low flow less than 400 ml per minute groups of patients. The primary and secondary patency in high flow group is higher than in low flow group as we expected to. This table shows the number of interventions for patient year and median time to first intervention according to intraoperative blood, blood flow volume. The median time to intervention after operation was longer in the high flow ABF and ABG patient group. In 2008, Dr. Lin reported about correlation of intraoperative blood flow measurement with autog autogenous arteriovenous fistula outcome. They concluded intraoperative blood flow measurement is a predictor of the primary and secondary patency of autogenous radiosepharic ABF. This graph shows the primary and secondary patency in high or low flow ABF. Autogenous ABF with high flow displayed superior primary and secondary patency rate than ABF with low flow. This slide shows the variables that predict primary and secondary patents by multivariable analysis. The presence of diabetes must be the must be the other important negative predictor of primary and secondary patent rate, independent of high or low flow volume. This table shows the comparison of a threshold of five studies reported so far to predict maturation of ABF. Bowman reported a significant difference in blood flow rate between functional and non-functional radiocephalic and brachiocephalic AB fistula. His data suggests a threshold value of 140 ml per minute for radiocephalic ABF and 308 ml per minute for brachiocephalic fistula to predict maturation. Two Asian studies by one and Lin reported that the threshold to predict radiocephalic fistula maturation was more than 160 ml per minute and more than 200 ml per minute respectively. At 2010, Swiss study by Stossi concluded that 120 ml per minute would be the predict threshold for maturation in radiocephalic fistula. In conclusion, intraoperative blood flow measurement has performed routinely in ABF surgery in Seoul St. Mary Hospital. We would like to recommend that an access site be abandoned if flow is less than 100 ml per minute. For access flow rate between 100 and 300 ml per minute, the access could be at least for early failure and recommend close observation of, of the fistula for at least four to six weeks before hemodialysis. If the initial blood flow rate is more than 300 ml per minute, we recommend four to six weeks for the fistula maturation before cannulation. So we can say intraoperative blood flow is very important predictor of the primary and secondary patency of autogenous radiocephalic ABF. In second conclusion, there are several advantages of a blood flow measurement during ABF operation. It is relatively easy and accuracy in ABF creation, and we can get the more objective and reliable information than physical examination. 
then we can eliminate the unnecessary revision after operation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for Dr. Yong. Uh, let's move to next topic. For the next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Scott Trerotola from America. His topic is what you don't know about central venous stenosis. Hey, well, good afternoon, and I hope the meeting is going well for everyone. Once again, I'm sorry I could not be there to participate in person. For this talk, I'm going to concentrate on central venous stenosis and occlusion, and really hopefully change the way you think about these as you go through your practice in the hemodialysis population. So you see a central venous stenosis or occlusion in a patient with hemodialysis axis, such as this patient with a left brachiocephalic occlusion. I think a lot of people would go ahead and treat this. And if I were there, I'd do a show of hands, but that won't work very well. So I'm just going to go ahead and give you the answer. The answer is actually no. This patient has a left forearm AV fistula, has absolutely no symptoms of arm swelling or facial swelling or breast swelling, has had this for years. The fistula works well, and everybody's happy. So we're going to rethink that see it treated or ocular therapeutic reflex. We're going to refine what we know about the demographics of central venous stenosis. We're going to understand the relationship of central venous stenosis to access function. I'm going to describe new use of old tools in evaluating central venous stenosis, and ultimately talk about doing the right thing for our patients. The most important way to manage central venous stenosis is to prevent it. We can do a lot in our hospital by advocating for a venous preservation policy not only avoiding pick lines in the arm, but also avoiding subclavian catheters, avoiding subclavian pacemakers if possible, definitely avoiding prophylactic pacemaker placement, epicardial leads uh, advocated by fistula first. And I'm told that transvenous pacing will be gone in 10 years, but I was told that five years ago, and it hasn't happened yet, so I'm not sure. In spite of this, unfortunately, in spite of our best efforts, we still see about a 50% prevalence of central venous stenosis in our practice, at least in a fairly recent study. So if we're unable to avoid it, how do we manage it? Well, first of all, the most important thing is to only treat symptomatic patients. By symptoms, I mean arm swelling, ipsilateral breast swelling, neck or facial swelling, and only those. Central venous stenosis does not cause axis dysfunction, with very rare exception. And so we don't want to treat somebody with central venous stenosis just because their axis is not working. If it's not working, it's because of a problem in the axis itself or out in the arm. If we're going to treat, we should do angioplasty until it's no longer effective. And we can use the definition of two failures in a three-month period from the DOKI, which I think is a reasonable definition. Certainly not evidence-based, but opinion-based from experts. If we're going to have an angioplasty failure, we should use a stent graft and not a bare metal stent. Although we don't have a randomized trial to look at this right now, all of the available evidence where stent grafts have been compared to bare metal stents has shown that stent grafts are better. So to the extent that we have the right size devices, and you probably have better devices in Taiwan than we do in the United States, we want to use stent grafts in the central veins just like we do in the peripheral veins. And we need to consider surgical options. Flow reduction, rib resection, and bypass are all important adjuncts when managing central venous stenosis. So this is a paper we published a long, long time ago, but it really is, a, I feel, a very important contribution. It's one I'm very proud of. Uh, Rebecca Levitt did a great job with this, showing that asymptomatic stenosis can only get worse when treated. So when left alone, nothing happened. These did not progress. But those patients that were treated with asymptomatic stenosis actually got worse or escalated their symptoms about 8% of the time. So, you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the point of do no harm, we want to make sure that we don't do harm to our patients and we don't, do, don't, don't treat those. These folks are collateralized. They, that those collaterals provide decompression, and that's how they become asymptomatic, like in the example I showed you. The folks from Luc Tremel's group in France provided further evidence of not treating asymptomatic central venous stenosis. In this retrospective study, they had 50 patients with uh, symptomatic central venous stenosis and compared it to 53 patients without symptomatic stenosis who, who had stenosis but were asymptomatic. 
One of the most interesting thing about this is that none of these patients had any prior catheters and they all had fistulas. So what this shows us is that the high flow from fistulas can often result in symptomatic centrovenous stenosis even without centrovenous catheterization. And this is something that we really didn't know about until this paper was out there. So this is important. So none of the patients in the asymptomatic troop got treated. And after four years, only 40% of the patients who were asymptomatic became symptomatic. And there was no difference in the out, out access outcomes between groups. And the treatment of centrovenous stenosis had the same results. So delaying that treatment by up to four years didn't worsen the outcome, didn't make it impossible to treat the centrovenous stenosis or anything. And again, this indirectly shows you that, that those centrovenous stenoses didn't affect the access function at all. These patients' accesses worked fine during that period. And again, uh, I, I mentioned that 63%, uh, not all of them, but 63% of them had no prior catheter. So when we're treating centrovenous stenosis, we want to treat only the lesion that accounts for the symptoms. We want to, again, angioplasty until that's no longer effective and use appropriately sized balloons. What do I mean by appropriately sized? A lot of people undersize. Now, this is in a U.S. population. In, a, in an Asian population, the size is maybe smaller, so I want to make sure I have that caveat. But here's a patient that has arm swelling and a left upper arm fistula. They have a stenosis at the junction of their left brachiocephalic vein and their superior vena cava. This was angioplasty to 14 millimeters with extensive elastic recoil, and this patient is not going to get any better. This is obviously still stenotic. After a 16 millimeter angioplasty, we have a perfect result. We don't need to go any higher, but we can stop at 16. But if that wasn't good enough, we'll go up to 18 as well. My general rule of thumb is that for the subclavian, we want to go for 12 to 16 millimeters, and for the brachiocephalic, 14 to 18 millimeters. And it's not, need not get, be perfect to get symptomatic release, but it's got to be good. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. What about axis dysfunction? Well, there's really very little or no evidence that centrovenous stenosis affects axis dysfunction unless the centrovenous stenosis is very close to the central vein. So, for example, if you have somebody with a graft in the upper arm and the venous anastomosis is uh, way in the upper arm and it's very close to a subclavian vein stenosis, that's just an outflow stenosis. Yes, that can affect function. If you have somebody with a chest wall graft, a stenosis in their subclavian vein, yeah, that's an outflow stenosis. But I'm talking about people who have uh, otherwise uh, upper arm or forearm accesses that are not close to the, the stenosis is not close to the outflow of that vein. Uh, and those folks, the stenosis does not affect their axis function. And I'm going to show you why. So we did do a, we did a prospective study on this. Uh, and Yan Yan did this, and he did a wonderful job with it. And we can see here that uh, we measured flow in the axis circuit. So before angioplasty of centrovenous stenosis, the, the flow was high. It averaged between 14, uh, excuse me, it averaged 1455 uh, with the range that you can see there. So even the lowest end of the range was still in the almost normal uh, axis flow area. So the centrovenous stenosis was not affecting flow. Interestingly, after angioplasty, the average flow changed very, very little. And as you can see, the range changed very little as well. So that even though these folks had successful angioplasty with resolution of their symptoms, because these were all symptomatic patients, their flow only changed on average 100 mils per minute, which is completely inconsequential. And so, or only a 14% change in flow. So centrovenous stenosis does not affect access flow. Uh, and you can see the 95% confidence interval. And this just looks at it diagrammatically. There were a couple of people who, whose flow went up, but very few. Most of them, as you can see, are pretty much horizontal. And actually one who's, or two whose flow actually went down. But nonetheless, in spite of the fact that there was no change in their flow, their symptoms were reduced in almost everybody. And the mean follow-up uh, was out, you can see, almost to a year. And you can see the, uh, the re recurrence was with a mean of 70 days with uh, showing us that angioplasty is effective, but it comes back after a while. And again, we want to use that angioplasty until it no longer wor works. Here's an exception. Here's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, here's somebody that has, is here for their first declot. They've got no arm swelling beforehand. The only lesion found in the access was this mild outflow stenosis right here. That was angioplasty to 8 millimeters, and the flow was only 510 mils per minute. The entire inflow all the way up to the subclavian artery was evaluated. There was no inflow lesion. And in fact, um, this was then treated 
with the an angioplasty of the subclavian vein and the flow doubled to 1100. So I think if you, there's no other lesion, then you should certainly do that. And I think the most important thing here is to note the proximity of the venous outflow of this uh, upper arm access to this subclavian stenosis. And that's probably why this stenosis, and it's also very tight, is symptomatic. And the other reason is because there are no collaterals. You notice for whatever reason this patient has not formed collaterals at all, and that may also have something to do with why this particular one was symptomatic. But this is a very rare exception. One time that we do need to do this is when some, we're doing a declot and somebody's got central venous stenosis. If we don't open up the outflow a little bit, we will get what I call log jamming where central clot uh, gets stuck here at the stenosis, and this can be a real problem to treat, so we want to make sure that we at least open that up before we do the, uh, the declot itself. Well, another thing we looked at is who gets symptomatic in, when they have central venous stenosis. So we looked at a cohort of uh, uh, almost 500 patients, and we looked at whether they were symptomatic and where the axis type was and, uh, and, and so on. And what we found, you can see the breakdown here between fistulas and grafts, male, uh, and the age. You can see the breakdown, about half these folks had, had central venous stenosis, so again, a 50% prevalence of central venous stenosis in our population. Um, and, but remember, not all of these are symptomatic. You can see the breakdown of the axis location uh, of the fistulas here versus the grafts uh, overall, and just a few in the groin. And we look at who got symptomatic. So for people that had fistulas, only 29% of them were symptomatic, whereas for those that had grafts, 52% of them were symptomatic. And importantly, overall, only 20% of these folks with central venous stenosis were symptomatic. And we graded the collaterals just to give you some sense of, of how, how many collaterals there were. So anybody with a fistula is less likely to get symptomatic than anybody with a graft. And then we looked at where the access was. And it turns out that of those with upper arm access, independent of whether it was a fistula or a graft, they were more likely to get symptomatic than those with a forearm access. And then if you look at somebody with a forearm fistula, that is the least likely to get symptomatic. And somebody with an upper arm graft is most likely to get symptomatic. So this, this demographic information gives us the ability to predict who's going to get symptomatic. If we do preoperative workup, and where we see a mild stenosis in the central vein, or even a moderate stenosis in the central vein, and that patient is going to be, get a, be able to get a forearm fistula, chances are they're not going to become symptomatic. And we should not angioplasty that central venous stenosis prophylactically, but rather put the fistula in and see if they get symptomatic. I would advocate that even if they're getting an upper arm graft, there's still only a low chance, less than 50% that they're going to get symptomatic. We should go ahead and put the access in, and if they get symptomatic, then we can go ahead and do the angioplasty. I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this study because this is a really, really interesting study that helps us use an old tool of pressure measurement to help decide when we want to further intervene after angioplasty and central venous stenosis. Once again, this study came, came from Taiwan, a really great study. This was a retrospective study of nearly 100 patients in which centrovenous angioplasty was done. I don't know from reading the paper whether these patients had symptoms or not. Uh, perhaps you can talk about it there. Maybe the authors are there in the audience. Um, these folks had pressure measurements done pullback, in a pullback fashion with a cutoff of 5 millimeters of mercury. So that was considered low pressure gradient, or anything over 5 millimeters of mercury was considered a high pressure gradient. And then they also looked at residual stenosis using a cutoff of 30%, which was considered success, or 30 to 50%, which was considered acceptable. There were some exclusions of failures and stents. Uh, they looked at post-intervention primary patency at 12 months. The percentage uh, of in the groups didn't differ, and the pressure uh, uh, groups, uh, the percentage stenosis groups didn't differ in their outcomes. The pressure measurement groups did differ in their outcomes, and that was statistically significant. And they looked at the combinations of success and low pressure, that actually beat acceptable uh, pressures. Success and low uh, pressures also beat a high um, pressure. Success and low uh, also beat a high acceptable by all statistically significant. Let's look at how this looks graphically. Now, these are subset analyses, and none of them are statistically significant, but they do show, do show us some trends. They show if that you have a success, an angiographically successful result and an angiographically excess, acceptable result, they don't differ, okay? So anything less than 50% may be okay. Likewise, pressures alone don't actually make a difference. 
okay? Here, if there's less than 30% stenosis, pressures, there's no difference in pressure, so you don't need to measure pressures if it looks good. Pressures alone don't help. If you get a good angiographic result, it doesn't matter if you measure pressures. So if you get a good angiographic result, you're pretty much done. What if you don't get a good angiographic result? Well, if you hear, here, if we look, the stenosis alone was not predictive if it was over 30%, but there was some divergence if it was under 30%, though not statistically significant. If stenosis alone wasn't predictive if it was also if it was greater than 50% versus stenosis, this is versus pressures, this is versus stenosis. But there is some divergence here, you know, it's close to being statistically significant. If you look at pressure measurements and less than 30% stenosis, um, then again, this is both pressures plus 30% stenosis, this is pressures alone, there's no difference. But here, and this is very, very close to being significant, if you have greater than 30% residual stenosis, measuring pressures probably helps. And the outcomes were much better when pressures were measured and something was done about it than if they weren't. So I think this is really valuable information. Measuring pressures is very inexpensive. And so when we have somebody that we, that we do an angioplasty and we're thinking about should we put a stent in there or not, we shouldn't rush to put that stent graft in, but rather we should measure pressures. And if it's greater than five millimeters of mercury, then we should put in a stent graft or refer that patient to surgery if they're a surgical candidate, uh, especially if it's in the subclavian in, area, in an area amenable to rib decompression. Or if we get an access, acceptable angioplasty result, or if the pressure is less than five millimeters of mercury, then pressures don't likely add value. We shouldn't do anything in those patients. So this is my central venous stenosis eye chart, and, and the size of the text is in, in terms of the importance. Prevention is the most important. Not treating asymptomatic central venous stenosis is least important, less important, still second most important. If you must treat, use angioplasty alone. Avoid stents if at all possible and use pressures to guide your treatment. If pressures support stenting, weigh the surgical options of flow reduction, uh, decompression, et cetera, before you think about doing that. And you, if you absolutely must use a stent, then use a covered stent, although that's not evidence-based at this point. So I hope I've made you think a little bit here this afternoon about avoiding the ocular therapeutic reflex. Don't just treat it because it's there. Rethink what you think you know about the demographics of central venous stenosis and who gets symptomatic. Understand the relationship between central venous stenosis and access function, which there is none. The new use of old tools such as pressure and ultimately doing the right thing. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, thank you for Dr. Chilatola. Let's move to the next presentation. For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Xin Junxian from Taiwan, sharing about hero graft experience in Chang'an Hospital. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Xin, from a vascular surgeon from Chang'an Memorial Hospital. Today, I would like to uh, share our clinical experience about the hero graft. Uh, first, I have no interest conflict. Uh, in current practice, patients usually outline their ACEs due to improve patient's care of the ESRT patient. The overall five-year uh, survival rate in this patient group is about 55%. It would be higher above 80% if the patient were younger. So the patients would uh, experience multiple access creation surgery during their life. And uh, may, some patients may have exhaustive high uh, venous property from the upper body. So in this clinical situation, the vascular assays uh, would be recommended by new list uh, doki doki guideline for vascular assays. If patient's uh, lifespan is uh, above one year, uh, there are two choice. One is low limb assays, or the second one is the hero guard we are talking about today. There are some literatures talking about the hero graft. Most of them were talking, uh, mentioned them as the tertiary assays. Uh, the hero graft had lower bacteremia than catheter, about 0.7 uh, to uh, 2.7 per thousand catheter days. Uh, some study, they compare the hero graft with the femoral AVG. Uh, they have a similar uh, six months uh, secondary patency, about 80%. They also share uh, a similar infection rate uh, about uh, 0.6 to 0.7 per thousand days. 
They also have similar mortality rate at six, six months, about 20%. Uh, some article also state the access related steel syndrome is about 6.3% caused by HERO. Some case report also uh, mentioned the HERO would be the alternative central vein runoff for a case of the central venous disease. The, this is a transitional component of the HERO. Uh, it's two components. One is the uh, venous alpha component, we call it VOC. Uh, it is the silicon tube reinforced by a nitinone known braid with the radio opaque mark on its tip. The second on the button is the uh, arterial graph component. It had a titanium connector and a standard EPTFV graft. It takes some time for maturation, so patients have to consider dependent from the lower body for times for weeks for maturation. So the manufacturer provides a neural generation that can connect to the early puncture graft. We call it superhero. So today, I would like to share our clinical experience about uh, this neural device. Uh, the first, I have to say the proper patient selection is essential to achieve the clinical success. Careful history taking to make sure the patient there is no other caster, defibrillator, or pacemaker disease within the patient's body. Uh, they will cause disruption during the operation. And we will do the proper muscle uh, mapping before the operation to make sure there is no other available means for access creation. If there has, we have during the regular limb access creation. And to make sure uh, the infra artery is above three millimeter to prevent the possible uh, post-operative ischemic syndrome. We must do also to share the patient have adequate heart function, uh, the ejection fraction above 20%. And the adequate systolic blood pressure is more uh, 100 millimeter mercury. The uh, uh, vascular entry size recommended by IFU is the internal jugular vein. Uh, the second we must to understand the accessory key provided by the manufacturer. Uh, the most important thing is the, uh, the 10 frame style and the VOC, uh, and the, 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 the IHB connector really connect to the VOC and the different size of the dilator, uh, dilator and the sheets. And the hemostatic plaque and the green clamp, they were introduced later. Uh, the following is uh, our surgical steps. Uh, first is access to the right action uh, via the uh, original dialysis catheter or cannulate the central vein uh, if we cannulate the central venous disease if needed. The second is explore the infra artery and make sure again the artery diameter, infra diameter is above three millimeter. And uh, we implant the VOC, the venous outflow component over the wire to the right action under the fluoroscopic guidance. And we do the proper tunneling of the venous component and the graft to prevent any possible kink. And we connect the graft and the VOC with the specialized uh, designed adapter. Finally, we anastomosis the infra artery. Uh, as you see, we can show the surgical picture from our hospital. Uh, you can see the, we explore the surgical, uh, the brachial artery first, and you can see a multiple scar from the patient's upper arm. The second goes to the fluoroscope. We, uh, we retain the access through the sleep table wire and gain the access throughout the previous uh, dialysis catheter and we implant the 20 French PLA long sheets within the patient's body. And uh, after the dilator removal and uh, before the BOC component stayed in, please uh, stay the hemostatic plaque to prevent possible bleeding and uh, the diesel air emboli. And uh, this is the assembled BDS alpha component. It contains the stylet and uh, we regularly uh, the IHB connector. And uh, the following step is to implant the VOC under fluoroscope. It's very important to keep the wire straight in the IVC and uh, uh, it must be taken. Uh, the stylet of the tip is three centimeter from the radiopaque marker. So make sure the, everything is properly inserted. And uh, we will check up the minus alpha component tip it, with the, is the radio opaque tip and the property on the right action. The second, uh, the next step, it goes on to the open part. After tunneling properly to the, uh, the, the connection part, uh, we clamp the, the minus alpha component with the green uh, clamp provided by the manufacturer to, to achieve the hemostasis 
and uh, prevent the uh, damage of the VOC component. And uh, we uh, implant uh, a six millimeter freezing early puncture graft with the standard wall to the upper arm body. Uh, we expand the graft uh, with the graft expander provided by the manufacturer at uh, least three times, uh, three times uh, recommended by the IFU to make sure the property uh, adapt to the adapter. And uh, we uh, connect the graft to the adapter. Care must be taken in this step. The graft must to put, uh, put in on the shoulders of the adapter. And then the next step is come the hinge with the, with the index finger and uh, the thumb. And uh, reinforce uh, the, the closure with the shelter instrument. We recommend it to line up the hinge between the surgical clamp and uh, the adapter. And uh, it's a very simple one to connect the VOC properly to the adapter shoulder to prevent the disruption. And finally, we uh, announce the inflow, the daily practice of we vascular surgeon. Uh, the post-operation care would, to give the patient is similar like the regular AB guard. We give the uh, proper wound care and the tracing to the patient and monitor distal limb perfusion status to monitor if any possible steel syndrome and uh, give adequate pain control to the patient's safety. And uh, we also give prophylactic antibiotics orally. Uh, uh, last, we do not give additional anticoagulant and uh, antibiotic action to patient. So uh, this is my conclusion about our clinical sharing about the hero graft. Patient uh, in exhaustive is in, in, in many property of from the upper parts is not uncommon in uh, modern medical, medical practice. The hero graft would be the uh, a reliable vascular assets choice in this kind of patient. It provides a superior uh, low bacteremia rate compared with the catheter, and it also carries a very a comparative result to the femoral graft. Uh, the next point, I think that it preserves the, the most important thing, it preserves the patient's self-respect. The patient don't have to take the, off their pants or underwear during the dialysis. I think the most important to patient's dignity. Uh, in combination with the early puncture graft, we call it superhero, would be a very powerful weapon for we vascular as a surgeon to avoid the temporary caster over the a patient's lower body. And uh, finally, the uh, proper patient selection and the meticulous surgical technique were also an uh, essential key step for clinical success. I'm Dr. Xin from Changke Memorial, uh, Memorial Hospital, Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Xin. And uh, now uh, we are going to discuss all the topic above. And uh, uh, let's welcome our uh, commentator and our speaker. We have Jackie online and uh, Dr. Locke, Dr. Liu, and uh, Edward, I see you, and Dr. Huang from Taiwan, and uh, Dr. Chen from Japan. So, uh, anybody have a question? Yeah, Edward. I'm gonna try and uh, I just uh, uh, unmute. I just wonder, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very clear. Oh, good. Um, my question is uh, for uh, Professor Treotola. Uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, and you've shown us why we shouldn't treat uh, asymptomatic central vein stenosis. And you've also shown us a lot of uh, dialysis access will work reasonably well, even in the presence of uh, central vein stenosis. My question to you is, um, uh, to put it the other way around, if you see a patient who's already got a central vein stenosis, but they've got really good veins in that arm, what would be your uh, uh, management? Would you consider putting in an excess in that arm with central vein stenosis, given that you know a lot of these will continue to work okay if they've got central vein stenosis? Yes. Uh, it's a pity um, Dr. Turotola could not join us today. So uh, oh. this question, uh, our panelist or our speaker, who have answer for 
this question. Yeah, Dr. Liu. Okay, just my opinion. Now, if you know a patient has an ipsilateral central vein occlusion uh, and if a patient has got good veins, I do not think you should try to put in a fistula in that arm. The reason is if you put in a fistula, the next day patient will come up, come in with a swollen arm. And then it is uh, very dramatic. Then perhaps you'll be forced to go back in and take out the fistula again. Now it is different if a patient has got a fistula put in and subsequently the central vein becomes stenotic. And what happened in the process is the body actually compensates. Now, this is something we need to think about. The veins in the upper limb can actually compensate. When you have a central vein occlusion, say brachiocephalic vein, your other collateral veins come in slowly. So they get enlarged. Because of this compensatory mechanism, patient might not even have symptoms because the body is able to compensate. So for those instances, I do agree totally with Triatola that one should treat it conservatively because you have excellent collateral veins coming in. So patient has got no symptoms. But at some stage, a decompensation may occur. You know, maybe there's now a cellulitis and maybe because of this retrograde flow into internal jugular vein, now patients come with a facial congestion and you find the eyes, you know, eyes become congested. In those instances, perhaps you have to think seriously about intervention. But if you have a known central vein occlusion, if you create a fistula acutely, the limb becomes so swollen, there's no means for the body to compensate. So I would, would not do a fistula in the limb with central vein occlusion. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Liu. And uh, I saw Dr. Huang also raise your hand. Do you have the same opinion or you have different opinion? I have a question. I am interested in endo AVF creation. Uh, if we do parallel endo AVF creation, puncture the brachial artery and the brachial vein. If uh, let hand. Uh, uh, stenosis, uh, the stenosis may happen in the puncture side. So we, we, how to prevent this, this condition? Yes, um, Dr. Locke, how can we uh, prevent this? Uh, because we have to puncture the brachial artery and the brachial the vein, vein, yeah, the proximal part. Yeah, so yeah. how to, is there any uh, stenosis uh, find out uh, during the follow-up? Uh, no, so as, as much as we have seen in our um, current fistulas that have been created, there have not been stenosis in, in a pentrocyte, so the access site to get into the vessel. We actually have not set, seen that yet, actually. So there's not been any. Okay, thank you. It could just be early. We'll keep an eye on it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, Dr. Chen from Japan. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, um, every specialist uh, give us a really uh, amazing uh, presentation. And uh, I want to uh, especially uh, thanks to John uh, because I mentioned uh, him uh, earlier that I want to see uh, endo AVF creation and the hero system. I think uh, that is the reason he called me. <laughs> uh, I have uh, uh, three well, questions or um, I hope uh, this, uh, you can give uh, me uh, some advice uh, because of uh, we Japanese do not have uh, this uh, device uh, for treatment. Uh, at first, uh, for uh, Dr. Locke, uh, 
Uh, this is a question about uh, and the AVA for creation. I think uh, that is use a magnet to put uh, put vessels together and using heat energy to uh, drill an enormous uh, hole. Uh, but uh, may I ask you, how do you uh, control the size of the uh, anastomosis? Okay. So yeah, thank you for that. When, when we create the AVF by surgery, uh, we will uh, consider uh, maybe we want uh, this patient for more uh, flow or less flow um, yeah. due to uh, he or hers uh, heart function. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know, how, uh, uh, how can you uh, control the size? So thank you very much for that question. It's an excellent question. And in development, um, I was at the very beginning of it. There's only one size right now. It's there's been a lot of modifications. Oh, huh? can you? Oh, there's been a lot of modifications, um, but that the the size of the anastomosis has not changed. So the channel that is created is uh, five by one, and it is a, it's something that um, is being considered. So we've changed, you know, um, the type of magnets. They're now square. We've created more magnets. The, the radio frequency electrode has gone from hockey stick to a saddle shape, but it, oh, still, yeah. creates, it still creates the same size anastomosis. And it's a question that I um, raised to the company because I, I agree with you. You know, smaller people with different vessels may need a smaller anastomosis. Uh, and a bigger person with bigger vessels may need a larger anastomosis. So I, I agree with you that this is something that needs to be further studied. So right now there's only one size. Well, yeah. okay, uh, I think so. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you have, uh, I, I guess you have a very um, good technique uh, to maybe uh, 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 put the vessel uh, together and you you measure the, the size and uh, use the heat energy. <laughs> well, it's it's already it's it's yeah. basically preset. So once the magnets align, the saddle and the and the receptor, it's all it always makes the same size. And the rotational markers will always make sure that it lines up. So if you line it up, you'll always get the this the right anastomosis. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, next uh, is uh, Dr. Yun already uh, still online? Uh, do we have Dr. Yun online? No, uh, no, we don't have. No, <laughs> uh, you don't have. Uh, and uh, uh, how about the doc Dr. Sin? Yes. Yes. Uh, He's here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay. Um, well. Uh, very nice to meet you, and uh, thank you. and thank you for your presentation. Uh, can I uh, uh, about uh, the uh, hero system? Uh, I'm very interested in this system. Uh, can I use it even if the patient has central vein stenosis or thrombus? Uh, in some cases, and uh, what about uh, the infection? Is that uh, just similar to uh, normal average or uh, perm catheter? Uh, because I have heard uh, John told me uh, the hero system is uh, like half AVG and half uh, prim catheter. All right. Uh, we don't, we just have two cases from our hospital. According to the literature reviews, I know, according to the minology, it would add as the upper arm uh, AB graft instead of the uh, catheter. It will have lower uh, bacteremia. In the questions uh -huh. they're talking about the central venous occlusive disease, there we, we we still planning some to do some case with uh, the central occlusive as a conduit to bypass the uh -huh. central venous yeah. disease. It is reasonable, but uh, there is <laughs> lacking of large scale uh, study discussion compared with the the, the other modality, including the BDA or the standing. Is still lacking the evidence? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, because I, I, I shared a, a case, a famous case uh, in Japan, uh, a 40 year old woman in uh, Tokyo. Uh, she has a, a, a obstruction uh, of central vein or uh, maybe uh, cephalic arch, but we do not have any device to save her. 
Yeah. So she have to um, choose a uh, withdraw uh, dialysis, and uh, she was died. Wow. Um, I think uh, this is a very very sad uh, story uh, for our doctors. Um, so um, uh, thank you again for uh, you share uh, your experience. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, about hero, I know um, Edward. Edward. I know you have lots of experience about hero graft. Uh, so how do you think about uh, the question of Dr. Chen? Oh uh, yeah, I was about to ask another question, but okay, I'll take this opportunity to maybe comment. Uh, um, in terms of the infection rates, um, the literature says that uh, it is the hero graft is better than perm cath. Uh, it is equivalent to uh, ADGs. Uh, and your next question was whether you can use it for central vein stenosis. Yes, you can. So it's indicated for both central vein occlusions, if you can get across the occlusion, and it's also indicated for central vein stenosis. Uh, my question is for uh, uh, Dr. Shamin Lok uh, about the endo ABS. Thanks very much for the very clear presentation. Uh, recently in Singapore, um, one of the other principal investigators have managed to get a uh, a nationwide grant for us to start using Indo ABF in Singapore, and I'm very excited to start using it. Uh, I mean, one of the participating sites. My question to you is: um, um, given that the anastomosis is created by heat, um, how soon afterwards are we able to anast uh, balloon across the anastomosis, and what size balloons can we use? Uh, that's a very excellent question. So it's it's created by radio frequency energy. Um, it's you know that's a really good question. Um, we have not. I, I I'm just trying to think of our experience. I don't think we've done anything earlier than. And I I could be. I, I don't want to misspeak. Um, anything you know for the traditional fistulas, you don't want to do anything uh, usually before six weeks. We have not seen um, a lot of need for that, actually. Um, and we just had a summit where people talked about their experience. And I think the earliest angioplasty, and I could be wrong, so please forgive me, and I can look it up for you, I think was at three weeks. Um, but we haven't really had to use it, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. In, wh in, which, so in which situation are you thinking of needing to angioplasty if, if there was an issue at the perforator or um, um, somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, in some occasions when, uh, for example, in our, our RCABFs or BCABFs, when they fail to mature, sometimes when you scan them, you see quite tight stenosis in the anastomosis. And, uh, and after about uh, three months, then I, if they fail to mature, then normally in this traditional uh, ABS, I would go in and I would, you know, be very careful because they are still quite young in astomosis. Mm -hmm. But I would try maybe about a, a five millimeter balloon, and I would just, just, just very carefully uh, balloon it. But right. these are so astomosis I... which are made by stitches, you know. Whereas in the endo ABS, it's yeah. just made by heat. So, so I, 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 I'm not sure. So, so it's very, an excellent very, question. Very, so I think that's a very excellent question. And, and one of the, I, my, my personal feeling is one of the benefits of the endo-AVF is when you create a surgical fistula, you're manipulating the vessel, you're clamping, there's a, a number of different things that happen. And it's because of that manipulation that you get the neointimal hyperplasia and the stenosis. Because the catheters go in straight and it's, and as long as they align, it's a very clean cut for less than two seconds. So we don't have that manipulation. And we actually haven't really seen, and uh, we're doing a global study, um, and we will be looking at neal intimal hyperplasia, but we have not seen that juxtanastomotic stenosis. And I believe that this is one of the benefits. Um, we did do a study looking at the endo-AVF versus surgical fistula. It was a retrospective study, it was a cohort, but we found that we needed to do six times fewer interventions you know, so we didn't have the stenosis that you would have with the surgical fistulas. And I think it's because of the uh, minimization of that manipulation. 
But as more and more officials come on board, and I'm very, very excited that you're going to be doing this study, we should probably look at that to see whether or not, I know it's excellent, you, you have that stenosis. So maybe that's something you could specifically look at. Um, and it would be interesting to join because we, we are just starting the global study. So you can connect with me later to see what we could do to look at that. Yeah. Um, the PI is uh, Dr. Tan, so I'll probably ask him to get in touch with you. If you if yeah, that's, it's, that's. An, it's an excellent question. I think it's very important to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, no ABF is a very great uh, method to create uh, AB fistula because uh, our, teach, our teacher always t tell us that uh, you have to do minimal manipulation to the vessel. But I think the open surgery could not do as minimal as endovascular treatment. So I think endo-AVF so have so uh, just proved this thing. And I saw uh, Jackie, raise your hand, yeah. Yeah, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all the very excellent talk in this section. Uh, I want to uh, give a little bit of my perspective on uh, Edward's uh, first question about if we know there is a central vein obstruction, and but the patient do have a very nice vein and artery, and whether we should consider using that upper limb for uh, uh, fistula creation or not. Um, I, I will look at it like this is, of course, if we have a even better other option on the opposite limb, we should not embark on the one that with the problem. However, if the other side is already exhausted, no option, I guess a, a very informed discussion with the patient will be very important. Uh, I, I will definitely explain to the patient, uh, maybe if on the other side, he, he or she will need a graft, but on the side that with the central vein obstruction, he or she will be able to use her native vein and, and uh, yes, there is a possibility that the arm will become swollen, but as what uh, Dr. Teratola mentioned, there is also 50% that it will, will not have any problem. And if it has a problem, that means we might need to go in and intervene the central vein, or if we fail, then we have to give up the fistula. So, so I guess if we involve the patient in the decision making at the first place, I, I think we can actually uh, utilize these resources rather than uh, completely uh, abandon it. Yes, yeah, Jackie, I have the same opinion with you. I cannot agree you anymore. Uh, because of the time limit, I have only uh, time for the last question and uh, I want to preserve this question for my buddy. Dr. Yen from Taiwan. I have a question about the endo ABF and uh, uh, the new technique uh, may create a new complication. Uh, Dr. Liu, can you share us the major complication on, of endo ABF and uh, if happened, how we can treat and the manager. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. So um, the major complications, it's actually a very good question. We actually haven't seen uh, any one specific major complication. The complication rate so far has been quite low. We've had, as you saw in the summary, really good patency, really good uh, outcomes. You know, when we first started it, when we were first learning, the major complications had nothing to do the, with the procedure. It had to do with the, um, the use of closure devices, uh, improper access of the, of the um, you know, accessing the brachial vessels caused most of the, the complications. So now with the new devices that we went from six French to four French, um, it makes it much more easier. You can actually have radial approach. So we haven't seen the same uh, major complications so in terms of any one particular complication being more than the other, we haven't actually seen anything predominant right now, but the experience is still very um, short and small. 
So we're gaining more experience. We, we've gotten over a thousand endo officials created worldwide, and we're just following up to see how they're doing. Um, and right now there's nothing really predominant that stands out as a major complication, but we will keep an eye on that. Um, you know, maybe not so much as a complication, but I think one of the things to keep in mind is um, the nurses are hesitant to cannulate because they don't know, they're, they, they don't see the surgical scar um, and they don't, uh, they're worried about cannulation, but I just want to reassure it's the same as, um, you know, other fistulas. It, it does feel a little bit different, but they should not be afraid of cannulating. But there really has been no major uh, predominant complication that stands out to date. Okay, thank you. We have a last question from the audience. This is the privilege for the, our audience joining on site. <laughs> Please. Oh, thank you. I'm, yeah, you're right. I'm the only uh, overseas participant here. Okay. So, my main question actually to Dr. Yoon from Korea, but I know unfortunately he's not here. Okay, he's not online. So, about the intraoperative blood flow measurement during AV fistula aggregation. Well, my problem will be that uh, recently I have a more case of children with uh, renal failure with no transplant option and as well as there is no PD option because of the infection rate is so high. So my question to Dr. Yoon actually, is it possible that I'm using intraoperative blood flow measurement to predict the maturation of this AV fistula? Well, if there is no Dr. Yoon, I expecting there is other uh, faculties can help me with this children case, and I, I hope I'm not uh, wrongly placed this question in this session, but I desperately need help because we have more and more cases of children with AV fistula. Thank you. So our panelists, anyone have experience about? to do a fistula for young uh, for, for children uh, in Taiwan um, uh, children if they need uh, dialysis uh, most uh, children uh, will refer to receive the peritoneal dialysis yeah that's uh, what this is the situation in Taiwan so uh, we also don't have many experience about doing uh, AV fistula uh, for children. Uh, our panelists, uh, do you have any experience? Our Japanese, uh, Dr. Miyata, do you have any experience about doing AV fistula for the children? Actually, I don't have. Um, we have several cases of the uh, pediatric uh, hemodialysis cases, but uh, they received the, the uh, TCC uh, permanent catheter. That's all, and uh, they are wait. They waited for the transplant. Yeah, transplant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. waiting for transplant. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, all our uh, speaker and our commentator. Uh, that's very good discussion, and uh, I have to close this section. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.